The face of boxing against the current pound for pound number one boxer in the world isn't something that comes around often and also, given that Canelo was only the pound for pound number one fighter two years ago, it's also a like for like in the sense that Crawford's replaced him two years down the line but it was only a couple of years ago that Canelo was widely considered the pound for pound number one. And what really adds a layer of intrigue to this is that Terence Crawford hasn't shown any signs of fading or slipping away despite his age, whereas Canelo's been under a lot more scrutiny in terms of his career trajectory and whether he's on the decline or not as of late. And given that Canelo's two weights above Terence Crawford, that's where the intrigue lies and that Bud doesn't look like he's missed a beat as of late and so he could potentially narrow that gap and it's worth considering that it was only in recent years that Canelo thickened out to a 168 frame. Now given that Bud did struggle with the weight cut against Errol Spence, he's actually more naturally a 154 frame than a 147 although it's worth considering even though his name value is at an all-time high and obviously Canelo is the face of boxing Bud is still jumping three weight divisions at least on paper from 147 to 168 and so this is essentially a Mount Olympus task although given how much name value he has now and obviously his dance partner being the face of boxing the two of those collaterally may well form the biggest fight that can be made in world boxing right now and certainly in America because when you look at that market in totality the likes of Anthony Joshua against Tyson Fury in terms of individual buys, would do probably more individual pay-per-view buys as a total tally than any other fight in world boxing. But it doesn't have as much appeal to the American market. And I feel that if you look at the recent pay-per-view buys for Anthony Joshua against Francis Ngannou in America, for example, those did under 5,000, if memory serves. So... Anthony Joshua against Tyson Fury is a massive fight and probably does more pay-per-view buys than any other fight in world boxing uh, in total. But in America, I'm not sure that's the case. I feel that Tyson Fury has cracked the American market, but he hasn't been able to build on how deeply he's in a position to be able to penetrate that market to the fullest extent possible because of that Daniel Kinahan Association ban. Um, and since he's been banned from the country, naturally, if you crack a market and then you're not able to visit that country, do um, media and press there as much, um, and you have less exposure to the market that you penetrated or cracked initially, that significantly handicaps the extent to which you can then... Um, get the most out of that market you've cracked. And so Tyson Fury against Anthony Joshua would do monster numbers in the UK, but in America, I'm not so convinced. Whereas with Terence Crawford and Canelo, you're not going to get as much of a um, customer fatigue, so to speak, in the sense that Canelo is the face of boxing in America and globally. And uh, Terence Crawford is also... A massive name there that has a lot of relevancy in light of what he just did against Errol Spence. Um, and his stardom has really catapulted uh, domestically in the States. And they're both in a position to be able to um, build on that, particularly in that market as well. Whereas Anthony Joshua and Tyson Fury have been fighting more in the Middle East as of late. And so if they're not fighting in America, that significantly limits the extent to which they can penetrate uh, that market. And so on that basis, relative to Terence Crawford and Canelo, it's a lot more harder for AJ and Fury to tessellate that kind of pay-per-view drive and numbers potential into the American market. And so if they're not fighting in America, that significantly limits the extent to which they can penetrate uh, that market. And so on that basis, relative to Terence Crawford and Canelo, it's a lot more harder for AJ and Fury to tessellate that kind of pay-per-view drive and numbers potential into the American market. But on a more one-on-one -on -one basis individually, it's interesting to note that Terence Crawford's Instagram following has actually tripled since the Errol Spence victory. It now stands at 1.6 million followers. And I remember doing an analysis just before then where Bud had just north of 580,000 followers and so for him to have tripled that following in the space of 12 months after that Errol Spence win 
speaks volumes and also eclipsing Errol Spence too in social media following, that does speak volumes about how much his brand power has grown now. As we know, that doesn't always necessarily translate into pay-per-view buys. Um, and I think that was pretty evident, for example, when there was the uh, TikTokers YouTube card where between them they had something crazy like 30 million plus followers all combined. And that didn't do well on pay-per-view at all. So it's not necessarily the most accurate rubric for measuring how big a fight is or can become. But uh, on the topic of Canelo, it's also worth considering that while there have been rumours and whispers he's on the decline and there's also been more of an appetite for him to fight Benavidez as well, the Benavidez fight's the one that stands out more in the public domain as more in demand. I think that's the best way of putting it in terms of public appetite as well as the hardcore boxing community. It's the one that both casual fans and hardcore fans alike have cited as top of their wish list for seeing next up for Canelo, given the position of his career that he's in right now as well. So Canelo against Benavidez is definitely the fight that, from what I've made out and seen online, and also from in-person conversations I've had too with various people, is that that's very much the fight that people want to see most for both of those guys. But I do think it's worth mentioning that if past his prologue, particularly at 147, if you look at where Crawford's coming from, in terms of name value, we've seen how attractive fights have been where guys have jumped up more than two weight classes in recent years. We saw Kell Brook face uh, Gennady Golovkin. That was in 2016. Two weight classes he jumped, and that had a big, big appeal in the UK. I was about to say massive. I uh, bit my tongue just in time because it wasn't massive, but a significantly large appeal in terms of pay-per-view buys and also the mainstream attention it got. It was very much a fight that people wanted to see. Similarly with Errol Spence against Mikey Garcia, we saw that another fight in America where Mikey was jumping up two weight classes and ultimately Garcia wasn't big enough to compete with Errol at that weight. And those are fights where, if you look at the name value of each, there's been a two weight jump or at least a two weight gap between them, but they've still done well on pay-per-view. Both of those fights, by the way, um, Garcia and Spence alongside Golovkin and Brook did upwards of 200,000 pay-per-view buys. And that's quite good going in today's market over the past decade in particular. So on that basis, if Ganelo fought Terence Crawford next, notwithstanding the three weight class difference and obviously the overall appetite preference, if you will, for Benavidez to face him instead, I still think that the Crawford fight would do very well on pay-per-view because name value does a lot for casual fan buys. It's, uh, it holds less regard amongst the hardcores who would much rather um, position the fighters that they want to, relative to the others, based on when they fought them and also the context around that. But the casual fans tend to discriminate less in that regard. And so on that basis, I feel that Crawford against Ganello would do very well on pay-per-view. And in terms of buys, I think it does upwards of seven figures. I think that if the Caleb Plant match in 2021 with Ganello did upwards of 850,000 buys competing on the same night as UFC's rematch between Kamaru Usman and uh, Colby Covington 2, that would have likely have done upwards of 900 if that hadn't been on the same night. So notwithstanding that, I would probably say this does upwards of 1 million buys on pay-per-view in America. And if past his prologue uh, with Ganelo against Triple G, 1 and 2, those did 1.1 million buys minimum for both of them. The trilogy pay-per-view numbers were skewed because with the DAZN deal, obviously, if you subscribe to the platform and then bought the pay-per-view, 
then you weren't paying the same pay-per-view price as everyone else, but that still got put into the same aggregate and tally as those who are buying as external customers new to the network. And so it skews the accuracy of the numbers. However, I don't want to go off on a tangent in that respect because that's a completely different argument. So diverting back to my crystal ball, if you like, of um, predicting the trajectory for pay-per-view buys for this one, I would say upwards of 1 million, upwards of 1 million, likely around the 1.1 to the 1.3 million pay-per-view mark. Because I do feel that element of intrigue with Ganello supposedly on the decline and Crawford not having missed a beat. I think that is still, based on the most recent eye tests, what could notch this over the 1.2 or the 1.3 million mark. So... That's my prediction in terms of pay-per-view buys. And uh, when we look at the relative benchmarking that I've explained earlier on in this analysis, I uh, hope that that sort of justification provides a little bit more grounding for why I've arrived at the conclusion I have done. But um, on that note, over to you guys and uh, let's discuss below. Thank you guys for watching. If you have any questions that you'd like me to answer for you in future videos or the extended breakdowns, just tweet them over to me. That's at ElusiveRaf on Twitter. If you guys want to see my daily fight analysis uploads, I upload those every day to Instagram and that's at Elusive 2.0 on Instagram.